I call Sue Moroni. Mr Speaker, not that long ago, just over a year ago, I stood in this House and I implored this House to never, ever forget the lessons that were learnt from Pike River Mine, as we had previously forgotten the lessons that we learned from Cave Creek just some decades earlier. I implored the House to never, ever forget the lesson that we learned from both of those instances that deregulation kills. That deregulation does not work in terms of the health and safety of working people. I thought then that maybe I was giving a warning to the House that we might forget those lessons in a decade or so. I did not expect to be standing in this House just over a year later telling that government they have already forgotten those lessons. I did not expect to be standing up this quickly and telling that government to get its amnesia in order because it has already forgotten those lessons and the bill that they have brought back to this House demonstrates that. Less than 12 months after I implored this House to never forget that, they've already done it and they're grinning about it. Well, I'm sorry, but um, I find that uh, reprehensible, actually, Mr Speaker. We have some of the families in this chamber today who have been deeply affected by previous governments forgetting about how deregulation kills people. We have some of the victims listening to this debate today. And I want to um, pay my respects to the Wahini Toa, the strong women who are here, Deborah, Sonia and Anna, who are here because they are fighting for other families. They're fighting for other families to never, ever experience what they have had to experience. And that is the experience of seeing a loved one off to work in the morning, the thing that they do every other day, the thing that they should do every day and come back from safely, and for them to never return. And make no mistake, Mr Speaker, that is what we are here to debate. That is what we are charged with preventing from ever happening to any family. And yet we have a government that has gone out of its way to ignore the findings of the Royal Commission, to ignore the findings and recommendations of its own independent task force, and to ignore the international evidence that tells us that one of the best protections one of the best ways to ensure that workers come home safely from their everyday lives is to make sure that workers have a voice in health and safety, to make sure that they are represented in that by having the right to elect one of their own to be the voice of health and safety. And I just don't get what is so controversial and so hard about that. What is so hard about that? That that government, that National Party, quivered in its boots when it heard some of, the, some of the employees with the worst track records in this country in health and safety come to the Select Committee and argue how onerous it would be for small business to have elected health and safety representatives <coughs> if workers asked for it. I want people who are listening to this debate to understand exactly what is so onerous because we're not talking about employers having to employ anyone additional. There is no additional cost involved in this exercise. This is a person who they already employ in their business who is simply going to be, on the request of their workmates, elected to be the person who speaks on behalf of those other workers because they have asked to have an elected representative. That doesn't impose any cost on business. It should not be something that good employers find at all alarming. And in fact, Mr Speaker, I have lost count of the employers 
who have come up to me in the course of the last 10 days who are embarrassed by this approach that's been taken by this government. They are embarrassed that that's been taken in their good name because the vast majority of employers do not support the watering down of the recommendations that came from the Royal Commission. They do not support that. And employers, large amounts of employers, feel that their name has been sullied in this exercise because of what that government has done. Now, we did have, and I want to acknowledge and support the speech um, of my colleague Ian Lees Galloway earlier, we did have large employers with very bad health and safety track records come before the committee and tell the committee that workers were going to run rampant and that they were going to use the ability to elect a health and safety representative for some other agenda, for some other secret, unnamed agenda. And I can imagine, and I've read um, a very good book about the, the, the tragedy at Pike River Mine, and I know some of those same arguments were used in that environment, some of those very same arguments, some of the same arguments Jonathan Young just used. Don't talk to the union. Don't have a representative. Come and talk directly with us. That was the same culture that existed in Pike River Mine. Right. It's exactly the same culture that existed there. And here's the National Party picking up that rhetoric and running with it and using that as an excuse to water down what is internationally accepted as being best practice when it comes to protecting workers in dangerous workplaces. Today, we had the debacle in question time of watching the minister, minister. the hapless minister, unable to answer the question about what high-risk industries would be required to have these health and safety representatives in place. Mr Speaker, knowing the answer to that question, the definitive answer to that question, is incredibly important when we are debating this bill. Because I said before that some of the, uh, the, the main proponents of this idea that you know, workers can't possibly have one of their own represent them in health and safety in small business were in fact large businesses. And I confidently predict that if this bill goes through in its current form, here's going, what's going to happen next. Those large employers with very bad reputations who have absolutely no respect for their workers or their lives, they will start to restructure their businesses so that they fit within the category of having fewer than 20 employees. Because we've seen it before. I can confidently predict it because we've seen it before when it comes to legislation that has been in front of this House that has been designed to protect vulnerable workers in contracting out situations and there have been similar provisions. We've seen the ratbag employers use those provisions to restructure their businesses so that they can escape giving their workers the best protection possible. So, Mr Speaker, I apologise to the House if I felt, sound a little angry. I am angry. I am absolutely furious about this because one of the things I did uh, immediately before I came into this House was I was a trainer of health and safety reps in their workplaces. So I have heard firsthand the stories of the devastation when it goes wrong. I've heard about the sorts of things that happen in workplaces, the sort of subtle and not so subtle pressures put on workers to go and do unsafe, demand, unsafe things in their workplace in the interests of increasing the profits to those companies. Make no mistake about it, Mr Speaker, we are in the business when we're debating this bill of ensuring that people come before profits. And that requires a backbone. It requires strong regulation. It requires understanding the dynamics at work in the workplace and how vulnerable workers are to having that pressure placed on them. This government are failing those families. The government is failing the 290 families who have lost loved ones since Pike River Mine. They are failing every worker who walks out the door and goes to work in a workplace with fewer than 20 employees. 
And by the way, that's a significant majority of workers in this country. We're opposed to this bill, Order. and I'm proud of that. Order.